Good morning. Good to see you guys. Good morning to everyone tuning in online. Good morning to Pastor Scott and the crew over at the Farmington Hills campus. Today we're going to be continuing our series on spiritual disciplines. We're going to be talking about silence and solitude today. So before we go any further, will you join me in prayer? Father God, we come to you in your mighty and matchless sons, Jesus' name. God, I pray that you would be with us this morning. I pray that I would decrease and that you would increase and be made much of in the lives of your people. God, I pray that you would just send your ministering angels to speak to our hearts. May the soil of our hearts be good ground for the seed of your word. Join us today. Oh God, we need you. This is in, it's in Jesus' name that we pray together. Amen. Silence is golden, but if we're being honest, sometimes silence can be a little creepy, it can be a little scary, it can be a little awkward. But silence, for the most part, is it's golden, it's valuable. Sometimes it can even feel like a luxury to be able to have some peace and quiet. So silence is golden, but sometimes it can be a little awkward. I want to show you the quietest place on earth. This little room right here is the quietest place on earth. It's an anechoic chamber in Minneapolis, Minnesota. That anechoic means no echo, meaning that the floor and the ceiling and the walls absorb all of the sound in the room. And this little room right here in Minnesota is the quietest place on earth. And sometimes people like to go in there and experience that and see what that's like to sit inside of the quietest room on earth and it just drives them crazy. True story, people go in there and they start hallucinating, it's not kidding. Because it's so quiet, you can hear yourself blink. You can hear the blood flowing through your veins. You can hear the stomach, the food digesting in your stomach. Somebody's getting creeped out already. You can hear the fluid swishing around in your mouth. You can hear your heart beat. You can hear your lungs pumping oxygen because it is that quiet. If it means anything to you, it's like negative 9.4 decibels or something like that. Extremely, extremely quiet. And for the most part, people can't handle it. People lose their minds. They knock on the door, get me out of here! Because it's just too quiet. And what it is is that we're so used to noise around us drowning out the noise inside of us that when we get in a quiet enough place, we get very uncomfortable. And I think the same can be applied to our souls. We live in a world that's constantly drowning out the noise around us. We, we're, we're constantly being immersed in noise through our devices, through people around us, through the various things that we do to keep ourselves busy. We're constantly surrounded by noise. And therefore, being in silence can be a tad bit uncomfortable. It can be a tad bit awkward. And here's what we know. Silence has a way of revealing things that noise hides. And solitude has a way of drawing us closer to the God who's been there all along. Silence has a way of revealing things that noise hides. And solitude has a way of drawing us closer to the God who's been there all along. Silence can be a little awkward. And if we're being honest, silence can be confrontational because silence forces you to come face to face with yourself. Silence all of a sudden reveals certain insecurities that may have been hidden. It, it, it brings fears to the surface, doubts, Discouragements, all of those can emerge when we finally get along with ourselves and it can feel like silence is just putting us face to face with ourselves. And it's a lot easier to focus on other people's weaknesses, other people's problems, other people's shortcomings than it is to come face to face with our own. It's easy to look at the news and say, look at that person and what they did and what they're doing and how foolish they are than it is to get along with ourselves and deal with our own weaknesses and wickedness that may exist in our hearts. Theologian Dallas Willard says this. He says, we can only survive solitude 
if we cling to Christ there. We can only survive solitude if we cling to Christ there because we can become too overwhelmed by what we're seeing, by what we're experiencing. And similar to the people in that anechoic chamber, we're like, get me out of here. I can't take it unless we meet Christ in that place. The gospel is this. The gospel is that I am aware of my flaws and my weaknesses and my shortcomings and my sin and the wickedness that may hide in my heart. The gospel says I am aware of that while simultaneously being aware of the love of God. This is the gospel. I'm not hiding. I'm not pretending it's, re- it's not real. I'm not pretending that I don't have problems. I'm not pretending that God uh, doesn't need to work on me. I'm not hiding from those realities. But I'm also very much aware of the grace of God and his love for me. This is the good news of the gospel. And sometimes we have to slow down just to be able to truly immerse ourselves in that and understand that. Silence has a way of revealing things that hide in the noise. And solitude has a way of drawing us closer to the God who's been there all along. The noisiness and busyness of life can make God feel distant. He says, son, I'm there. I've been there all along. Daughter, I'm there. I've been there all along. And silence and solitude has a way of making all of that more real to us. If we're going to be apprentices and followers of Jesus, sometimes we have to follow Jesus into the quiet. We have to follow him into that awkward space of silence. And that's what we're going to see in our text today. As Jesus is training his disciples, he is raising them up. He's giving them big work to do. He's giving them tasks that stretch them but also he's going to draw them close to him in silence. This this training that he's uh, 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 putting his disciples through is kind of like this rubber band. He's stretching them, calling them to do some things that are a little uncomfortable and outside of their comfort zone, but he's calling them to rest in him. Stretching them, they're like, oh my goodness, how are we supposed to do this? This is crazy, Jesus, what are you doing? Then he says, come rest in me. And perhaps some of you know what that's like for God to stretch you and call you to do something that's crazy, bizarre, out of this world. I can't do that. What are you thinking, Jesus? Then he calls you to rest in him. And that's what we're going to see in our passage today. This is Jesus calling his disciples. He says, calling the 12 to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits, those are demons. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belt. Jesus is in straight manager mode. He's giving out assignments. He was like, okay, Peter, we got a demon possession over there on Eight Mile. Go take care of that. That would be great. Thank you. And then James and John, I need you to go heal somebody over on Joy Road. That would be awesome. Thank you. He's handing out assignments. And they're like, this man is crazy. I was a fisherman just not too long ago. You want me to go cast out a demon? How am I supposed to do that in my own strength? He's stretching them. He says, take no bread, no bag, no money. It's like, you hear what this man's talking about? He's telling me don't take food. I can't take a lunch. This is crazy. What, what, what is he talking about? I'm going to call human resources on this man. What are these work conditions? He told us to go and take nothing with us. He's stretching them, teaching them to depend on him, not to rely on their resources, not to re- rely on their own strength or their capabilities or their training. He is completely stretching them and forcing them out of their comfort zones. And they go. Eventually they go and they do the work. Let's take a look. It says they went out and they preach. They preach that people should repent. You know how authoritative that is? These guys who were just fishermen, some of them, untrained men, going out into the culture and telling people to repent and turn to God. They have no special endorsement from the religious authorities of the day but they're going out with boldness and proclaiming the kingdom of God. They're doing this thing. Since they drove out demons, 
and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. Let's not skip over that. We're talking about demonic spirits. These everyday guys are casting out demons out of people. They're healing people. And I imagine they're having a good time doing it. After a while, they're like, okay, we got this thing. They're, they're kicking, they're kicking some, some devil butt. They're like, we got this thing. Uppercut to the devil. Mule kick to the devil. They're doing their thing. And the crowds are starting to grow. The demand is starting to grow. And they're doing a lot of work. They're just healing people left and right. Healed, healed, healed. Left and right. And then finally they have to go tell Jesus. They're like, Jesus, we did it. You're right. You're always right. But we did, we did it. And now the crowds are starting to grow. And we're starting to get more demand. Oh, my gosh. Healed, 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 healed. We're tired. Uppercut to the devil mule kick. They're just super, super busy doing the work of God. And they're starting to feel a level of exhaustion. And Jesus sees this. Then because so many people were coming and going, they did not even have a chance to eat. Remember, he told them, don't pack food, don't pack money. And they're just working, working, working all day. And they get to a point of exhaustion. They're stretching. Jesus is stretching them. They're working past their natural capacity, and they're getting a little worn out, and they reach their limits. They finally reach their limits. And we all have limits. We all have a point where we get to where it's like, oh my gosh, how am I gonna do this? How am I supposed to accomplish this? God is putting more on me than I can bear. How am I actually supposed to fulfill this task that God has given me to do? Theologian Rich Velodes talks about the pace at which we live in our world and how a lot of times we're living past our limits. It says, our souls were not created for the kind of speed to which we have grown accustomed. Thus, we are a people who are out of rhythm, a people with too much to do and not enough time to do it. Our lives can easily take us to the brink of burnout. The pace we live at is often destructive. The lack of margin is debilitating. We are worn out, and all of this, the problem before us, is not just the frenetic pace we live at, but what gets pushed out from our lives as a result. That is life with God. In the frenetic pace of life, a lot of times the first thing to go is life with God. And we got to go to work, we got to feed the kids, got to feed the dog, got to wash the car, fill in the blank, the things that you got to do. And a lot of times the thing that gets pushed out is life from God. And as Jesus is stretching these disciples and calling them to this great work, he's also setting a rhythm for them that will allow them to not forget life with God. He's trying to teach them to follow in the path that he is following he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. He sees that they're tired, they're exhausted, they're worn out. The temptation for them might have been to keep going, healed, healed, healed. All right, you've been here twice today already. Get away. Healed, healed, healed. The temptation might be to keep going. He says, no, no, this is not how you do it. This is not how you do it. I want to show you my rhythms Come away from the crowds. I know I called you to the crowds. Let's, let's walk away, separate ourselves from the crowds, and get some rest. He's teaching them how to depend on him. To fast forward on how this story goes, eventually more people keep coming, and then that's when you get to the place where you have the 5,000 people. And they're like, oh, my goodness, we have to feed all of these people with two fish and five loaves. And they feed the people. And it's just another example of God teaching them to depend on him, to rest in him, he says in this part of the story. But let's, let's pull away, let's pull away to a quiet place. In the original, original language, that's Aramis. It's a deserted, remote, solitary place, desert or uninhabited wilderness or grass lines, implying some context to be a forsaken, desolate place. Terrence Gray translation, a place where nobody at, a place where nobody is at, a place where you're by yourself, a place where you get alone, just you 
in God. He said, let's go to a place like that, a place of free of the distractions. You've done good work today, but let's, let's separate from the work and get some time alone with the Father. He is teaching them a healthy rhythm. You stretch, you walk by faith, but you rest in the Father. And Jesus modeled this. He's our great example for how this looks in real time. Let's take a look at when Jesus sought solitude. He sought solitude to prepare for a major task. Whenever he had something important to do, he would take some time and separate and spend with the Father. In Luke chapter 4, we see a picture of him staying up all night praying and spending time with the Father because the next day he was going to select his 12 disciples. And before he would make a big decision like that or make a big move like that, he said, first, I need to spend some time with my Father. And I believe that's an example for us. Before we make major decisions, before we prepare for a major task, I believe we were to follow Jesus' footsteps and spend some time with the Father. He also got a way to recharge after work. That's what he's modeling in the story we're looking at. These guys were busy. They had been doing a lot. They had been pushing hard. And now he's saying, let's, let's get away and let's spend some time with the Father. And that's an example for us. When we've been doing good work in this world and doing things and trying to keep up with all of the obligations, Jesus says, pull away and spend some time with me. He also did this. He got away during seasons of grief, seasons of heartache and heartbreak. He, he got alone to grieve with the Father. Sometimes the temptation with grief is just to keep going and not to acknowledge what we're actually feeling. But Jesus modeled getting time with God, slowing down enough to actually feel what's going on inside of us, embracing some of that awkwardness so that we can give that broken heart to the Father to fix. He did this before making important decisions in times of distress and to focus on prayer. The temptation is to view this as some kind of strategy for life for the sake of being efficient in life. But sometimes Jesus got along with the Father just to be with the Father, just to spend some time with Dad, just to be with him because being with the Father is the reward. That is the reward, to be in his presence, to hear from him, to allow him to speak truth over, him, over us, to allow him to lavish us with his love. And so sometimes Jesus got away just to be with the Father. That's what Luke 5.16 tells us. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Busy man, busy schedule, busy job, saving the universe. Sounds like a busy man to me. But he often got away just to be with his heavenly father in silence. See, silence has a way of revealing things that noise hides. And solitude has a way of drawing us closer to the God who's been there all along. Sometimes you're in a busy season and stuff is just happening. And you're like, where is God? Where is God in this? Where is God in this? And, and God is like, dear son, dear daughter, I've been there all along. I've been there all along. It can be tempting to view, <clears throat> it can be tempting to view this talk about silence and solitude as something for contemplative people. Um, <clears throat> caught a little something in here. Oh, my gosh. Thank you, thank you, thank you, wife. Uh, it can be tempting. Thank you. It can be tempting to view silence and solitude as something for contemplative people. Let me slow down and drink this water. <laughs> and practice what I preach a little bit. <clears throat> okay, voice back. Okay. Yeah, it can be tempting to view silence and solitude as something for contemplative people, for weak people, because maybe you have something important to do. You have an important job. You have important priorities in life. And that slowing down stuff, that's, just, that's for those people who don't have important stuff to do. Not, not people like you who have a, a big role to play or something like that. You don't, you don't have time to slow down. For Jesus Christ was the king of the universe. 
is the king of the universe, came on earth to save the entire world. No one had a more important task, but he needed time and space to slow down, to be with his father, and so do you and I. One of my favorite historical figures is a guy by the name of William Wilberforce. William Wilberforce led the abolition of slavery in the British Empire. He's the guy who muscled that through. It took him 20 years, argument after argument, fight after fight, day after day, week after week, campaign after campaign, pushing as people pushed back on him. He said we need to abolish slavery in the British Empire. People didn't want to hear that. An entire economy was built on that. He was pushing against the grain. And some people asked him, man, how, how did you do it? How did you actually fulfill that hard task? Because William Wilberforce is an example of what it actually takes to accomplish something meaningful in this world. You have to be able to push against things. Life isn't easy. People are going to push back on you when you try to do something of value in this life. It didn't get doggone hard. But this is what William Wilberforce had to say. He says, bless be God for the day of rest and religious occupation wherein earthly things assume their true size and ambition is stunted. He would take time on Sundays to be alone with God. And when he was alone with God, he said that earthly things would assume their true size. Sometimes things seem too big. The priorities seem so big. And God wants you to get along with him so he can show you that he has priorities bigger than the priorities that you have. And as a matter of fact, you can lay those priorities down. And he wants you to get along with him so that the problems in the world can take their true size. I know that we have a lot going on in our world today, but sometimes that can get so overwhelming, so big that it consumes us with anxiety. But God wants you to know that I know those problems are big but I'm bigger. My plan is bigger and I am sovereign and I'm in control and we have to slow down enough to put things in their right proportion. This is how Wilberforce was able to do what he did. He, he was able to allow things to be able to shrink down to their true size, but a lot of his colleagues didn't. A lot of people in his day in the 18th and the 19th century, they didn't. They didn't make it. They weren't able to persevere. A lot of them actually took their own lives in that season because of the pressure was so intense during that time in history. A lot of them snapped. He says this, speaking of his colleagues, he says, with peaceful Sundays, the strings would never have snapped as they did from the over-tension. With peaceful Sundays, the strings would never have snapped as they did from over tension. Now, this isn't to say that a Sunday is the only day that you can rest. That's, that's not what I'm saying, and I don't think that's what this point is. The point is that you need time and space to stop and just be with the Father. In our world, we see a lot of this. We see a lot of stretching, stretching, stretching to the point of snapping. And we see a lot of people, we see relationships stretch, 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 too much pressure on that thing to the point of snapping. And maybe you've been there, maybe you are there where you're stretched and like, I don't know what to do because I feel like life is calling me to keep stretching and I feel like I gotta keep going and keep doing, but you're human. And eventually, if we don't, we feel that snap. Jesus says, I have something better. There's a better way of life. There's a better rhythm than this just to stretch yourself. But follow me and I'll teach you my ways and I'll teach you my rhythms. And this isn't about following rules for the sake of following rules. This is about following a person and he's teaching us how to live in a way that causes us to flourish, not snap and break. So how do we do this? What does this look like in real time? I think it looks like finding a pace. 
I think that's what we see from William Wilberforce's story. He found a pace, a pace of grace where, yeah, he stretched. He did meaningful things. He did meaningful work. He had a meaningful life. But he knew that he wasn't the center of the universe, so he's, he found a pace where he was able to allow those things to rest. And sometimes it looks like finding a place. It doesn't have to be anywhere fancy or, 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 or anything like that. It could be a dining room table. It can be taking a walk uh, along the street in your neighborhood. It could be on your roof if you got to get up there to get away. But it's finding a place for you to be with the Father. Sometimes you need a plan so that you, when you show up, you know what you want to do. Am I going to pray today? Am I going to spend some time in the Scripture today? Am I just going to journal today? But maybe a plan. And an important part of this that I've realized is sometimes you need a partner if you're really going to do this. Sometimes that looks like a spouse. You're giving your spouse a break and saying, hey, I'm going to watch the kids today. I'm going to take care of the responsibilities today. You go get some rest and vice versa, and you support each other that day. If you're not married, that can be a friend. Maybe you take care of some responsibilities for a friend, take a load off of a friend. Maybe you need some accountability to check in on you and say, are you actually resting? Are you actually taking a break? And you're like, no, I'm not. But you need somebody to check in on you to make sure that you're actually doing it. And I think this is how we actually begin to live into these rhythms of grace. And I just want to give a word of caution on some of this. The last thing I want is for this to be creating some kind of quiet time shame. I kind of been around that where you're afraid, oh, I missed my quiet time today. The devil's, I mean, God's going to strike me down with a lightning bolt because I didn't meet him for my quiet time appointment. So it's not about that, keeping the rules always, but it is about your heavenly father saying, I want to meet with you. I want to restore you. I want to repair you where you've been broken. I want to remind you of who you are, because maybe you're tempted to believe some lies about yourself right now. And I want to remind you the truth of who you are and the truth of who I am. I want to help you see things in their right proportion because some things have gotten too big in your life and they're, called, they're causing you to worry. They're causing you to be anxious and fearful. And I want you to see that those things that seem very big aren't as big as you think they are and they're not bigger to me. They're not bigger than me. And he extends an invitation to us. And maybe you just need a pace, a place, a plan, and a partner to help you do that. Will you pray with me? Oh, Father, we come to you in your son's Jesus' name. God, confessing that this is hard stuff, that this is countercultural stuff. Our world keeps going and going and going, and we're tempted to keep up with it. God, we confess fear of not doing enough, fear of not being enough, fear of not having enough, and that just causes us to go, go, go. God, God, we lay those fears and anxieties at your feet. Help us to rest in you and to trust in you and to follow your rhythms. It's in Jesus' name that we pray together. Amen.